Welcome to our listeners in all their various forms. Uh, it's me, Stephanie Wynn. You must be some kind of therapist podcast together with Lubitsa from the Coalition for Child Protection in Macedonia. This uh, interview's raw footage is going to end up on my YouTube channel and also translated into Macedonian. So I know we only have so much time. We have a couple people in the audience and this video will be used for multiple purposes. You have a lot of questions to get through, but first, could you give a brief introduction of who you are and how we're finding ourselves here today? I'm Yubica Mushulanova Ristevska. I'm coming from Macedonia. Uh, here as a representative of the Coalition of, uh, for Child Protection in Macedonia. Uh, recently formed coalition. It has 27 organizations that uh, joined us in the uh, battle for against gender ideology that is uh, happening for the last two years uh, in Macedonia. Uh, we started to have a huge uh, LGBTIQ lobby in the government and uh, it's pushing changing of uh, law systems and uh, implementing uh, gender uh, ideology in the education system. So uh, the parents started to organize itself uh, to fight with it. And uh, this is how after two years we ended up having a coalition and uh, other several organizations to uh, connect with each other and work uh, with each other to help uh, parents to protect their children. So I'm a mother of two boys and uh, uh, also have another function. Uh, I'm a president of a parent school board in my school, and this is how everything started. So we are really very active and uh, we are trying to make people aware of uh, the uh, differences and uh, the trouble that uh, the gender ideology will bring to this conservative uh, society that we live in. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, I know you have several questions. Let's just go ahead and dive in. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, because uh, I would like to, you to introduce yourself. Who are you? What do you do? Uh, why do you do it? And uh, we are really very appreciated that uh, uh, you accepted our invitation to do this webinar about the gender ideology. So go ahead. Sure. So in brief, my name is Stephanie Wynn. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Oregon in the United States. Um, I have been practicing for nine years, licensed for six. I've worked in a variety of settings. And over the last few years, I've been increasingly concerned about the sort of standard of care for how therapists are expected to treat the rising phenomenon of so-called gender dysphoria. And so I've done a ton of research. <laughs> it's become my obsession for the last few years. Um, and I came out publicly about a year ago um, after immersing myself in the research, that's when I joined Twitter, started blogging, um, started building the podcast that I, I launched in May of this year, 2022, um, because I, I felt like I needed to speak out about these issues. So I am still a therapist in private practice. I no longer work with adolescents or anyone presenting with gender complaints because I can't adhere to the standard that is expected of therapists to follow. I can't practice the affirmation model in good conscience. So what I do instead is I work with, you know, a broad population of people with a number of presenting problems, um, but also parents who are concerned for their children. Um, I'm a safe place for them because a lot of other therapists, if the parents turn to those therapists, they'll be told to affirm. And I can actually see them as good parents, not bigots, and validate their concerns and talk about the complexities of the mental health situation in their family. Um, and increasingly, I'm working with detransitioners and desisters. I consider myself an advocate for victims or survivors of gender malpractice. And I'm currently working on a book, which is a really daunting project that I'm just at the beginning of, um, but it's a, uh, a book that I'm tentatively calling the Detransition Survival Guide. Well, that is so nice to hear. Okay, so uh, first of all, could you explain uh, what is the difference between gender dysphoria and gender ideology and being trans? And what is the background of both reasons for being diagnosed with gender dysphoria and reasons for considering oneself as trans? And what are the, sym the symptoms, manifestations of uh, both of them? Right, so, you know, traditionally, um, it used to be called gender identity disorder in the DSM-4, now in the DSM-5, the Diagnostical and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, version five, it's uh, gender dysphoria. Um, 
But traditionally, this was a pretty rare diagnosis for people, typically males, typically from a young age, who had a uh, severe and persistent sense that they were the wrong sex. And, uh, you know, what, what we know about the history of gender dysphoria, it was rare. It was primarily males. Um, going through puberty was a struggle, but ultimately most people who had gender dysphoria in childhood would come out of puberty having resolved um, their dysphoria. And amongst males, they would typically either grow up uh, to be, well, so a lot of males presenting with gender dysphoria early turn out to be gay. Um, so that's sometimes called the homosexual, transsexual, or HSTS if they do choose to pursue transsexual medical procedures. Um, there's also uh, a condition called autogynephilia in males that typically presents a little bit later. Um, it's less common for adult male autogynephiliacs to present early in life with gender dysphoria, but those are heterosexual males who, for whom it's, it's a fetish. Um, but that's kind of the, the classic presentation, the most common variety um, before it became, let's call it what it is, trendy, <laughs> right? So it was yes. rare. Mm -hmm. And the standard of care was something called watchful waiting, which is basically, let's just basically see if it goes away on its own through the natural process of going through puberty and grappling with the body that you have, grappling with your sexuality um, and, you know, allowing for desistance. And, you know, during the course of the 20th century, various medical technologies became available. Um, but, you know, I would say they're all still in a pretty experimental stage with a lot of risks, factors, consequences, and unknowns. Um, and then what's happened over the last couple decades is there, there's been this gradual rise. Uh, actually, let me back up a second. You know, there's also historically been gender dysphoria in females. And the, you know, classic presentation of that was a tomboyish girl who was likely to grow up to be lesbian. Um, and, you know, there, there are people on our side of the gender issue who said that was me, you know, like Stella O'Malley, right? She's, you know, famous therapist in, in Ireland. She's, uh, you know, part of the GenSpect team. She's, uh, part of Gender Wider Lens podcast. And she's one of those kids who says, when I was a girl, I desperately wanted to be a boy. I was sure that I was in the wrong body. I was mad about it. Um, so, you know, there are both males and females who had gender dysphoria as, youth. But um, again, there's that kind of that 60 to 90% natural desistance rate where the, the discomfort with one's natural sex goes away if the person's left to develop. Um, and, you know, the cultural environment has shifted, right? Because those boys and girls were more likely to get picked on for being gender non-conforming. The boy who wanted to wear a dress, the girl who wanted to climb trees and fight with the boys and get muddy, you know, those kids would sometimes be picked on for being gender atypical, um, which I think is actually a better term than gender nonconforming. Uh, but what's happened is you've seen this cultural shift um, in which, I'll call it what it is, right? Being trans has become trendy. Um, and I'm sure you have some other questions to dive into that more, <laughs> so I won't go into too much detail. But you see this 4,000% increase in the number of, of girls specifically. So it used to be more boys than girls, now it's more girls than boys. And you also see a cultural shift around how we think of what it is to be trans. So when you talk about gender dysphoria versus the idea of being trans, trans is a label that a person puts on themselves, right? It doesn't have any fixed definition. Um, for some people, they mean transsexual, meaning that they have had medical procedures to try to resemble the secondary sex characteristics of the opposite sex. Human beings cannot change sex. Every cell in your body is either XX or XY, except for a very rare, you know, small number of people who have intersex or conditions or disorders of sexual development, but they don't disprove the binary. They actually prove the binary. But, you know, the vast majority of people are either XX or XY. Every cell of your body is that way. And um, there, everything works together, right? The, the brain, the endocrine system, the reproductive system, uh, the cardiovascular system, every system of the body works together in either uh, the male body or the female body. And uh, there's a lot of denialism about that, but I'm getting off track. So what does it mean to be trans? Well, it's a label a person puts on themselves where they're either identifying as the opposite sex or some other quote unquote gender. Now there's this idea that there's all these different genders. Um, and it 
could come with any number of steps toward medicalization. But you see this kind of depathologizing of it. Um, and I want to kind of describe the narrative of pathology and the narrative of depathology, if that's okay, because I think it's related. Can we talk yes. about that for a moment? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Of so course. the narrative, yeah? Sorry, what? Yes, of course. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so the narrative of pathology, right? The narrative of pathology is what I call this kind of underlying story that you'll hear told some of the time in which um, this condition called gender dysphoria is considered an illness, right? Whether you, you call that a mental illness or a, a physical illness, um, because there's a lot of confusion about whether it resides in the mind or the body. Um, but it's, it's this illness that requires extreme treatment, right? So things like drugs that will alter the course of your entire life and invasive surgeries are typically reserved for severe conditions. So an analogy would be metastatic cancer, right? If someone has metastatic cancer, then they need both a surgery to remove the tumor and they need chemotherapy and radiation. Those are harsh, invasive, expensive, consequential treatments, but they're worth it if the alternative is death, right? That's, that's when the risks and benefits kind of support that level of intervention. So the narrative of pathology says that gender dysphoria is this extreme condition and the alternative to these extreme treatments is death. Right? It's the you know transition or suicide myth, which we could get into because I have a lot to say about that. Now, the narrative of deep pathology is what I'm calling kind of the opposite story, where the story is there's nothing wrong with being trans, being gender colorful, being gender diverse. It's all wonderful. And you don't have to have gender dysphoria or you don't have to have any of these criteria, it's just, you know, pick your gender. Some people are born in the wrong body. You know, the doctor just assigns you a sex at birth and maybe they got it wrong. If they got it wrong, then that just makes you one of us and you're special and you're wonderful, right? So there's a story here that there's no pathology to this. There's no mental illness to it, but the medical system is supposed to give you all these things, right? Because if we're talking about normal human diversity, and all the ways that it's wonderful to be a special human, there's no other case in which, because you're a wonderful, colorful, special human, and there's nothing wrong with you, doctors need to give you all these things, right? Those two don't normally add up. Normally, if you're expecting the medical system to do things for you, it's because you have some kind of illness or contagion. Uh, so these are kind of two very different, disjointed underlying narratives but you'll find that people who are proponents of gender ideology kind of flip back and forth between these two narratives. So what does it mean to quote unquote be trans? Well, sometimes it means you're somebody who has gender dysphoria and you think of it as an illness and you think that that means that you need these medical treatments for your illness. Uh, or maybe it's just an identity that you choose, whether or not you, you choose uh, to medicalize it. But it's all based on a conceptual framework that there is this idea idea of a uh, gender identity that that you can have this and it's kind of like the concept of a soul right the special part of you that's different from the sex of your body and that's more important and that should govern how you're treated in law in medicine and in social situations yes <laughs> that is the crazy part of it uh okay my second question uh as you already said, uh, the previous statistics show that most of the affected from gender dysphoria are men, while uh, that significantly uh, changed for the past 10 years. Why do you think there is a huge increase in children claiming to be trans, especially among girls? Right. So it's nothing new that adolescent girls are uh, sensitive to social contagion, right? Anyone who has ever been an adolescent girl can remember certain things like how much our friends mattered to us, how much fitting in mattered to us, how much it mattered to be recognized as part of the tribe, you know, whether that was listening to the right music or having the right shoes, learning the right mannerisms for how to get other girls to like you and respect you or climb the top of the social totem pole. All that stuff is normal adolescent girl stuff. So is a degree of, let's call it kind of hysteria, right? Girls at that age 
are on this hormonal roller coaster and it creates all these powerful emotions, right? And, and you combine that with all these other kind of developmental factors and you can look back in history at all these different kind of manias that took over girls, right? So I, there was the composer, I don't remember when this was, like sometime in the 1800s, do you ever, do you ever hear of listomania? Yes. Right. So, so there's, you know, you can go back in history, right? There's, I, I can't remember off the top of my head where and when all these things took place, but there was like the laughing contagion in one group of teenage girls. But, you know, more recently in American history, at least most of what people I know will, will remember, you know, cutting, right? We know that yes. um, girls cutting themselves has been socially contagious, anorexia and bulimia. Yes. Um, and then in the field of just mental health in general, there have been some kind of contagious ideas. You know, the idea in the 40s and 50s that people needed lobotomies <laughs> as a form of mental health treatment or the um, repressed memory syndrome, right? Um, so there are these trends and crazes. One way to think about it is like a mind virus or, um, you know, Richard Dawkins meme theory, which God Saad talks about in The Parasitic Mind. Um, the idea that I like to think of it as like we have a psychological immune system that protects us um, from various forms of illness. And in teenage girls, they haven't really developed a robust psychological immune system yet. In other words, they haven't developed a strong sense of health, self. How could they? They haven't had enough life experience. And they're girls, so they're naturally agreeable and sensitive to social interactions, which all means that they're going to be more susceptible to contagious ideas. and. Ideas are contagious if they play off of our powerful emotions, instincts, and drives. So when you when it comes to the gender stuff, there's a lot of powerful emotions, instincts, and drives that it taps into, right? A lot of these kids, prior to identifying as trans, they were lonely, bullied, traumatized, ostracized. A lot of them have autism, so they're, you know, pretty socially clueless in certain situations, which might have led to feeling like there's always something different about me, right? Led to a lot of shame and uh, internalizing negative behaviors, right? And then you're, you're given this idea that feels like a free pass to being included and being special. Like this is the narrative. This is a story that explains why I'm different. And it makes me special, you know? It's like being told do you know, I don't know, in Macedonia, you have the story of the ugly duckling. Is that a fable? We have similar. Okay, right. So so basically the, the story of the ugly duckling is, you know, that, that there's, there's this little duck that always felt so ugly and got so ostracized as a duck. And then one day the duck actually finds ah, out that yes, yes, he's yes. a beautiful swan. We have the same swan. story here. Yes, yes, right. yes. We have the same so story. It's like, so it's like being told... You poor little thing that your whole life you've been told that you're an ugly duckling. Guess what? You're a beautiful swan, you know? And who doesn't want to hear that? Who doesn't want to have a path toward being included or special? And you see this lowering of the criteria of what it means to quote unquote be trans. And if you look at what those criteria are, they're things that we, uh, that most people experience in adolescence. Like, do you feel uncomfortable with your body? Do you feel like you're different from other people? And what we're leaving out of the picture here is that these girls have, many of them have survived sexual trauma, sexual assault, and they've been exposed to a sexualized culture. Their peers, adolescent boys, um, even if these girls haven't had their own sexual trauma, their peers are watching pornography, the likes of which no previous generation has seen. I mean, the porn that boys and girls have access to from an early age is abundant and extreme and it creates this highly sexualized culture plus you see on social media what it is to be a female is you know to be like an instagram model so these girls are basically being sent this message that what it is to be female is to be a sexual object who's expected to perform this version of femininity that looks impossible and uncomfortable and humiliating Right. And, and they're being shown all of this through porn, through social media, through how their peers are treating them, through how people are talking about things. And they're like, if that's what it is to be a woman, I would love to opt out. Like, get me out of that. Do not put that on me. Right. And then, you know, what to speak of the girls who've actually been physically sexually assaulted or who've gone through more intense harassment. Um, so there are all these reasons that the idea of opting out of womanhood 
um, is very appealing <laughs> for girls. And then the, the, the answer is just given like candy, like, come here, little kid. Don't you want to be a beautiful swan? Testosterone will solve all your problems. Plus there's this kind of uh, narrative about euphoria, the idea that you feel this gender euphoria, that you feel so wonderful, right? And of course there is that initial honeymoon stage when someone starts taking a new drug. Testosterone is a really powerful drug. And so is estrogen for, for males, right? Mm -hmm. Plus when you've been sold the idea that this thing will solve your problems, whether it's getting a binder or your parents affirming your name change or getting a mastectomy, when you're sold this idea that getting that next stage will make you feel better, then there is that honeymoon phase, right? And plus, if you've done something extreme to yourself, then uh, the human psyche is very, <laughs> it's a very complex, complex thing. It'll get to work to convince you that you've done the right thing and haven't just made a drastic mistake. And sometimes that means you'll kind of double down on um, believing and reinforcing that you've done the right thing. But you know, those are short-term uh, results that we're seeing when people talk about gender euphoria or they talk about their dysphoria dissipating. You know, there was like a study that came out recently that was looking at people's uh, mm -hmm. subjective ratings of their chest dysphoria and how it changed after three months post-mastectomy. We're talking about teen girls. That's not the right length of time to be following up. If you're going to remove a girl's breasts forever, I don't really care how she feels in three months. I care how she feels in five years, mm -hmm. 10 years, 30 years, right? Yes, Plus, exactly. is chest dysphoria the right thing to be measuring if the reason a girl is uncomfortable with her breasts is that she's been surrounded by social media telling her that she should feel uncomfortable with her breasts rather than surrounded by positive influences of, you know, responsible women who can mm -hmm. say, yeah, that's totally normal to be uncomfortable with puberty. Yes, having your period sucks. Welcome to womanhood, but we're gonna help you get through it. That's what these girls need. Yeah, but usually kids are really insecure when puberty comes, so. Right. We usually have to support them and not uh, encourage them to go to dysphoria process. Okay, my next question. Uh, from your experience, uh, what would be the best way for us uh, as an organization to protect the children from this ideology and keep them safe uh, from the German, uh, from the gender affirming uh, operations and drugs? Right, so can I ask about um, where are things at legally right now in your country with how psychotherapy is regulated? Do you have laws against quote unquote conversion therapy? Uh, yes. Well, uh, right now we have a huge uh, changing of the laws. Uh, they tried six months ago uh, to change uh, the identification uh, in the personal documents uh, for changing sex. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, then we interfered a lot and uh, we stopped that process in the parliament. We sent letters to the parliament and uh, uh, the law was uh, withdraw uh, from the from the parliament and uh, that didn't succeed but uh, uh, I, i'm telling you very quietly they are really changing a lot of laws and uh, especially the most important law was changed uh, three years ago nearly uh, the education uh, law the 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 law for the education system the primary education system that was changed. I think there will be a change in the secondary uh, education system too, but they are implementing the gender ideology uh, slowly in every subject. People are not, uh, I mean, the parents are not aware yet, uh, but we are uh, also uh, realizing that uh, strong uh, physiotherapists are working for the gender ideology because right now LGBTIQ, uh, government uh, is really very strong and the lobby is very strong with this government that we are having right now. And uh, they're pushing uh, the LGBT agenda agenda very, very much uh, in the whole law system. And uh, right now we are, uh, there's a changing of the criminal law and the hate speech and uh, they made even the, the uh, what was the, um, uh, they're forming some uh, uh, 
government bodies that uh, they will follow us on uh, internet and on the social media uh, if we are spreading uh, the hate speech and uh, uh, some of some of the members already got uh, some uh, court issues uh, with that and uh, the psychologists are also divided uh, some of them are speaking really very open, openly about uh, the subject and they are against it. Uh, of course, this is the science and we cannot uh, uh, turn in one hour <laughs> just to say that uh, we are supporting the uh, transgender uh, dysphoria. So uh, it's really, it's developing and it's developing very fast. Uh, we have a lot of changes in the law, but let's hope that we're going to stop as an organization. Mm -hmm. So I can't speak to a lot of those areas. Um, and you know your government infinitely better than I know your government. What I can speak to is my fields of psychotherapy. Yeah, but the, you know, the, here, here your, uh, your experience is very important for the psychologists in our country because well, many of them are that. really quiet about this mm -hmm. subject uh, and uh, they're not speaking openly and they're not supporting us uh, and uh, mm. that the dysphoria is, uh, is, is an illness that uh, right now is even taken from the, from the list of the illnesses uh, in the list following the World Health Organization. And a lot of changes uh, ha has been happening there. And the, many of the psychologists are not speaking openly about uh, this subject. We are really encouraging them to support us and to speak more. Okay. So what well, is uh, that? that was, that was, I was uh, even referring from uh, your experience, what would be the best for uh, best way for us as an organization? Uh, what can we do to protect the children from this ideology and uh, to keep them safe from the gender mm -hmm. affirming operations and drugs? Right. So within the field of psychology, I would definitely encourage um, providers to speak out. Um, I, I don't know what your current laws are regarding the um, the redefinition of conversion therapy, but I, I think that's a major area to focus on because I would say as a first step that therapists need to be able to do our jobs. And if there are laws that make therapists fear that they will lose their license over questioning someone's so-called gender identity, then that's really going to stop a lot of people from practicing ethically. Um, so I would say that that would be one area to focus on is, is to look at what laws have been passed or what laws people are attempting to pass to consider it a form of illegal conversion therapy for a therapist to question anything surrounding a person's so-called gender identity. So the rationale behind this is that in most places where this stuff has gone on, the field of mental health has gotten really wrapped up in the field of uh, gender affirming medic medicine, right? So they require therapists to write a letter or provide a diagnosis or sign off saying that this is the right treatment for this person. So our field is implicated. And if therapists were to all just stop doing that, it would really throw a wrench in the system. But uh, you have a lot of ideologically entrenched therapists who make it their entire job. At least I know you do in the United States. I don't know where things are at in Macedonia, but there are these kind of letter writing mills where people can just go and say, I'm here to get a letter for gender affirming care. And they'll meet with someone who just exclusively focuses on that and writes them a letter. I don't know if these clinics ever say to anyone, no, we don't think this is right for you. Um, so it's, it's a corrupt business model that really abandons the standards of proper psychotherapy of doing a you know thorough assessment and, and understanding the complexity of the picture. But I think, I think you have to make sure that therapists have the legal freedom to not worry about risking their careers 
if they want to explore these issues. So I would look into those laws, you know, like, and sometimes it, um, it's by age, like, they'll say, like, no conversion therapy for minors, right? Now, to be clear, nothing I do is conversion therapy. Nothing anyone I know does is conversion therapy because we're not trying to convert anyone. Um, and there's, you know, you can watch episode 11 of my podcast with Helen Joyce to learn more about the myth of conversion therapy. But I would say protect the ability of therapists to do their job. I would say that any older therapists who are nearing retirement, who are concerned about this, really need to take a chance because there are a lot of people. Usually they who speak can't... more loudly. Yeah, there are a lot of people who, you know, if you're 40 and you have three kids and you're planning on retiring in 30 years, you don't feel like you can take a chance with your career. But if you're 60 and your yes. kids are in college and your house is paid for, <laughs> then, <laughs> you know, it's like, what do you have to lose? I mean, obviously, maybe a few more years of working, worst case scenario. But I think that people who are nearing retirement should really take a chance on standing out about this. Another thing that I would recommend. Yeah, this is, uh, this is, is, I'm sorry for interrupting you. This is the case mm -hmm. that right now is happening in Macedonia because uh, the psychologists and psychiatrists in Macedonia and uh, what you already spoke is uh, a strong message for them because uh, what is happening right now in Macedonia is that uh, they're facing an increasing number of uh, rapid onset gender uh, dysphoria. And uh, ho however, most of them uh, haven't fa faced such cases before as Macedonia is a very conservative country and young people started to come out uh, once uh, the LGBTIQ lobby in the government has uh, become very aggressive. So uh, this is uh, what you will say is uh, how, how can, what would you suggest to them? Uh, how should they fight to protect their field in, uh, intact from politics and uh, stay pure scientific? And the most important, how can they keep their oath to not harm while at the same time uh, they must follow the World Health Organization standards and uh, on the other hand, they have to protect the children. So what we do here right now is the message that you will send is for those young psychologists that uh, we need them to help us in our yeah. battle. Right. So for the young psychologists and therapists in training, um, many, many people who are very early in their careers reach out to me and they see the problem. And I hear from people who are in graduate school or starting grad school, or they're just starting to see interns. And they're already thinking about specializing and working with detransitioners. I think that's a really excellent idea. So what I would recommend to anyone early in their career, if you're still in graduate school, is think about um, potentially specializing in working with detransitioners and go about your education in that way while you're in school, right? Let your teachers know, let your school administration know, hey, this is something I'm really passionate about. I have been learning about all these people who regret taking these steps and I want to work with this population and then engage in your classwork with that population in mind. You know, the, it's it's very easy to be labeled a bigot or a transphobe if you speak out about this stuff. But remember who you're fighting for, right? You're not doing this because you're hateful toward any group of people. You're doing this because you're concerned about people who say that they've been harmed. That's the reason we're fighting, right? So go yes. about it thinking of yourself as a disability rights advocate, if that helps, because you are advocating for people who have had certain physical abilities taken away from them by medical malpractice. That's another way to put it. You know, you're helping malpractice victims. And that's a very special population with very special needs and very low rates of trust in, in our profession. Uh, what about uh, the advice for parents? So what would be your best advice for them? How can they protect their children when a gender ideology is already implemented in the school and the textbooks talk about gender identities? Uh, what should they do to their, uh, if their child comes out uh, as trans? Okay, so first of all, take a deep breath and try to stay calm and think about it like this is a marathon, not a sprint. I don't know if you use that expression in Macedonia, but basically yes, it means the it's, same. Okay, right. So it might be a while, okay? <laughs> and you don't want to burn out 
early and you don't want to get reactive in a way that's just going to push your child further away. At the same time, don't let your kid bully you. Don't be too agreeable. Don't pretend not to know what you know. Don't pretend not to care about what you care about. But take a deep breath, practice grounding yourself, start bolstering all your own self-care, right? Make sure you're getting good sleep, Make sure your relationship with your spouse is strong. Make sure you're exercising and playing an instrument, whatever you do for your self-care, because it's not going to help anything if you are a nervous wreck. So that's step one. Okay, step two. You obviously are going to be doing a lot of research, right? So you have to kind of balance taking care of yourself with all the obsessive researching that parents start to do. When you're researching, of course, make sure you're researching what are these kids being exposed to on social media. So a lot of the parents come to me just baffled saying, I can't believe my kids said this thing, right? Fill in the blank. It's always something absurd that their kids said. And they're like, how can he or she possibly think that? And and I just kind of break the news to them that actually that's what they're all saying, right? That's what they're all reading online. That's what they're seeing on TikTok. That's the rhetoric that they're learning. And it might sound like they're saying something very unique to them because you've never heard it before and it's shocking, but make sure you're familiarizing yourself with what your kids are paying attention to online. You're going to need to set strict boundaries with their online access and your kids are probably more tech savvy than you are. So you might need to get some help learning how to effectively set up parental controls that kids can't get around. I would say be clear and consistent with your rules and why you have those rules and stand on principle. Don't go on the defensive. Don't over explain. Don't raise your voice. Have your principles and don't always let it be about gender. Don't get into a headbutting argument over the issue of gender. When it comes to something like setting limits with your kid's screen time, the rule can be as simple as I need to make sure you get enough sleep to be ready for school in the morning. So all screens are taken away at 9 p.m. You can read a book before bed. That's the rule, right? Don't get into it with the gender issue. The matter of principle is too much screen time is bad for you. You need to get some sleep, right? Same thing with safeguarding their behavior online. You don't have to make that all about gender. It can just be there are strangers on the internet who take advantage of young people. I need to monitor what you're doing. Or, you know, I understand that numerous studies have shown the impact of Instagram on depression and anxiety in adolescents, right? And don't say in teen girls, even though your daughter's a girl, because she's going to say, I'm not a girl, right? (laughs) Um, So try not to make it about gender. Try to make it about basic principles. Same thing with if you're, you know, stopping your kid from getting a binder. Say, I've researched the issue. I found that it can cause, you know, permanent damage to the rib cage, breathing difficulties, um, and chronic pain. And I'm not comfortable allowing my child to harm themselves. It's my job to get you to adulthood healthy and happy. And you can hate me all you want, but I'm your mom. That's the rule. Um, so try to make it about principles. Don't make everything about gender. Um, don't take things they say at at face value because they've probably been consuming a certain script, a certain narrative online or through their peers and friends in school. And um, just think of it as maybe the possibility that my kid's in a cult, right? And that they're saying what people say in that cult. Now, your kid will try to reject parts of themselves, parts of you and your family. They're going to rewrite history They're going to, you know, scream and throw tantrums when you call them their name. Um, They're going to, you know, refer to the name that you gave them as their dead name. They're going to, you know, call you names and try to hold on tight. It can be really painful to, uh, it could be really painful to see your kid treat you that way. But again, stand on principle of this is the name I've given you. It's, you know, you have a nickname at school, you're experimenting with identities, fine, but 
again, stand on principle. If you refuse to call your daughter he, for instance, have a principle for that. You know, I'm a biological realist. I believe in our sexed bodies, and that's what I base my assessment of someone's sex on. You know, end of story. Try not to get defensive. And try to keep a close relationship with your kid doing things that you've always enjoyed doing together, doing things that your kid loves that are healthy, connecting with family, friends, connecting with your community, um, you know, people who've always known your kids, people who are positive influences. Hold an expectation that your kid will still participate in those activities, that they will still come to family dinners, that they will still come to your church group if you're a person of faith. And um, if they want those other people to quote unquote recognize their gender identity, it's going to be on them to explain it because you don't agree, right? So a lot of kids want their parents to not only quote unquote affirm their identity, but they want their parents to do the work for them of introducing them to people as the he, him and all of that, right? And don't, don't cave in, just say, if you want to tell people you have a different name, that's on you, but I'm your mom and I'm not doing that for you. Um, so just hold some boundaries, try to maintain a close connection. Don't get into a dog fight. Don't, get defensive, don't argue over things that are ridiculous, and try to take the pressure off of the gender issue. Thank you so much. That would be uh, very useful uh, for some of the parents that are uh, facing this kind of issues. And finally, uh, our last question, uh, where can people find you? Are you available for free consultations? Uh, or advices? Are you available to respond to some questions that parents and uh, people from Macedonia might have for you? Sure. So um, people can find me in a number of places. So my podcast is called You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist. That's available on every podcast platform like Apple and Spotify. It's available on YouTube. But this interview that we're having will be on my YouTube channel. And increasingly, um, as I think I explained earlier, um, people are increasingly contacting me wanting advice on different things. And so I basically offer two routes. So I offer what I call a free public consultation, which would be like this sort of thing, right? We can have a conversation that will benefit other people and I'll share it on my YouTube or I do private consultations and I charge a fee for that. Um, I can be followed on Twitter at some therapist, on Instagram at some therapist. My website is sometherapist.com. Um, of course, what I do publicly as some therapist, as you must be some kind of therapist podcast, is not therapy. My private practice as a therapist is separate. It's just here in Oregon, and that's called Real Talk Therapy PDX. So I only serve people in Oregon. Nothing I do in the public eye constitutes therapy. It's just me coming from my personal experience and sharing what I'm concerned about with the public. And so when I offer consultations, it's not therapy. It's more talking about this sort of thing. Um, now, people can also reach out to me if, if you need help finding a therapist or um, people who are victims of gender medicine. I can help in a few ways. So I can help them look for a lawyer. I don't know any lawyers in Macedonia, though. <laughs> um, I can help with uh, looking over clinical documentation um, from the affirming therapists that you saw. I can help provide mental health resources for detransitioners. And then um, with my book, uh, the, again, the working title for the book that I'm working on, it's going to be a while, but it's a Detransitioner Survival Guide. And um, the way that I'm currently working on the book is I'm forming relationships with detransitioners and asking them to email me and uh, they can write to me about anything. Of course, we start off with a, a contract. I have people sign a contract before we get into anything because I want to make sure the expectations are clear. Um, but uh, once we've agreed to work together, then again, this isn't therapy. It's just kind of a free correspondence. You write to me and I write back and I try to make I try to say something helpful, basically. And then through the process of writing back and forth about what detransitioners are struggling with, I hope the book will come out of those letters. Um, and yeah, anything anything you need is at sometherapist.com or you can email me at hello at sometherapist.com. So if there is anyone, like you were saying, who wants a consultation, again, we can do a public consultation for my YouTube channel or a private consultation for a fee. We are very grateful. Thank you again for uh, having us and uh, answering our questions. It means a lot to us. Thank you for yeah, the support. Yeah, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your questions. I, I know there's so much more to talk about. 
No, well, uh, maybe we'll leave it for another session of uh, questions because when we sure. uh, when we publish this video, I, I, I know that uh, there will be parents that will have uh, some other questions and we'll schedule another meeting and uh, another webinar that we can answer all the other questions that parents might have specially for you. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. It's been a pleasure and thank you for reaching out. <laughs>